first reading that I ever did when I was uh, just barely starting my grad program, I did up here in Ventura, um, uh, you know, something like eight or nine years ago now, and uh, uh, I went so fast that I burned through my poems in maybe three minutes. It was for the release of Bear Flag Republic. So uh, fortunately, I've read a few times since then, and I probably won't do that tonight, but uh, it's, it's really nice to be back up here because I have great memories of Ventura. Um, I'm going to start with a poem uh, called Skin, and uh, it is um, a reflection on a car accident that I was in. And actually, come to think of it, that's in the poem, and you don't need any more explanation. So I'll take it from there. Skin. I left a shred of skin on the inside of my wrecked car, the windshield scraping off the frill of my knuckle, like a chef's knife separating a piece of dough. The tatter, this tatter of knuckle skin hung there like frayed gauze, the limp, discarded flag of a ghost ship. It lost its color while I watched, changing from pastel pink into a kind of mummified gray, severed from the blood and heat of my hand, uprooted and dying with the slow regularity of a puddle growing stagnant. The Jetta had rolled four times in the rain, gaining its tires and losing them again, like a wounded animal who does not yet know it is dead. Although I saw the ground rushing up from above, although a rock wedged into the open door and yanked a handful of hair from my skull, I had not been hurt until I brushed the inside of the windshield. Now, fluttering from the limp sheet of safety glass that droops inward above the steering column, is this veteran patch of my skin. Skin from the same knuckle that broke Brian Haster's nose with the sharp, sudden motion of someone splitting firewood. The same knuckle that has brushed the insides of parted thighs and sometimes moved deeper, sending incomplete and mysterious messages from beneath skirts and pant legs. The same wrinkled thimbleful of finger that moves along the gentle lunar incline of my girlfriend's face in the dark. This overlooked piece of myself is hanging from a shard of glass the size of a carpenter's nail, finishing the parched business of dying, and I am regretful. This knuckle that has brushed away tears has been cured like leather in paint chips and motor oil. Now it will be replaced by something smoother, by the pink skin of new growth that cannot entirely be trusted, skin that I will have to build from scratch, that may not turn out as well. Somewhere else on the side of the freeway is that clump of my hair, maybe dyed black, covered in transmission fluid and tar, wrapped around rocks and tied into knots by the turbulence of passing automobiles. I hope that a few strands have been buffeted to other places, carried by the contrails of big rigs up into the Cone Pass to rest with the ashes of my cousin wrapped around an axle and brought up north where a blue jay will tuck it into her nest inside the latticework of the Golden Gate Bridge. These silly dreams are important because this skin is not going anywhere. It will be towed away with the car frame once I've cleaned out my possessions. A secret bit of humanity tucked into the crushed hulk such places make of cars, hidden away inside the wreck we make of the world. Chris, Chris gave me that last line uh, uh, like, a, like a decade ago. So uh, if you didn't like it, his fault. If you liked it, I got to give credit to him. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> I get a lot of mileage out of that poem. I might owe you more than that. <clears throat> so uh, you can't tell by looking at me now, but um, I used to be quite the punk rock kid, like uh, embarrassingly, like maybe well into my 20s, but uh, we'll keep that between us. Um, and uh, uh, that means that uh, I had all my other uh, punk rock friends. And one of my first serious jobs was um, booking concerts at a local like at youth, uh, at risk youth club uh, in Pomona. And um, it was a great job. And I had this kind of ringer girl that knew every band in all of Pomona and uh, knew the uh, owner of the record store down there by the glass house. And um, 
sadly, um, she hung herself at uh, uh, 19 or 20 um, after a couple of years of helping me with this when she was an older teenager. And um, it always kind of haunted me while I had that job, obviously, because I worked with her every day and she always seemed to pop up. <clears throat> and so I have a series of poems that, that deal with her and this is uh, one of the first ones. Kaylee. Now that she is dead, I sometimes see punk girls with wide blue jean hips or in pink Marilyn Monroe sundresses with big polka dots walking down 2nd Street. And the adrenaline pours through me sharper and faster than the way her mother howled when they took her casket from the vintage hearse. A car not unlike Kaylee's 57 Ford Fairlane, except charcoal instead of robin egg blue. Kaylee was a classy, classy girl her mother says, once she steadied herself. Kaylee's uncle holding her up by her arm. All the kids in the funeral are wearing sunglasses, running hands down their blue jeans to erase invisible press lines. The kids still have their mohawks, peacocks preening at the edge of the grave, blue hair gleaming under the hot hammer of the sun, whose light is so bright and inappropriate against the black jackets and absolutely vulgar where it glints off of safety pins, still dangling from the hastily removed band patches. My heart clenches and unclenches in the heat, drowning in blood, trying to squeeze it all out. On the funeral booklets, rung between black polished fingernails, is a picture of Kaylee. It is her in the desert, broad and sepia toned, beneath the same dry sun that's here at her funeral. She's leaning against an ancient Corvette, black and bone smooth, so polished that all the lights in the sky flare up in a second corona. She's leaning back, the porcelain hands in her pockets, the insides of her thumbs touching the light tattoos of vines scrolled between the dip between her hip bones. Beneath the photo, it says, give me a chance to shine and I will eclipse the sun. There's a place inside of me that collects guilty cobwebs and nightmares like a fly strip, a place hollowed out from being the last person ever to speak to her, the last person who did not feel the flat static creeping between her words, the low sound of a faucet losing water pressure, the person who did not see their eyes were as flat as the photos in week old newspapers, at least not until after the fact. After the wake, I handle her journal, the one I know was hidden behind her misfit's lunchbox. I want for there to be no clues in it, no hint of that silence suffusing the calligraphy strokes, strokes in India ink or the black and whites of Audrey Hepburn pasted around her poems. If not here in the photo booth stickers, if not under the cover of ticket stubs and programs, then it was in that last conversation, the coked up boyfriend stories, the tiger laying in the shadows between palm fronds, its stripes making it both hiding and hidden, all of it just another patch of sunlight and shade springing out and pouncing before my eyes could possibly adjust. Two cups of tea poured into the grass. And it is actually here in Miramar, number two, which you guys should pick up because it is positively chock full of good poetry, uh, you know, aside from mine. So it's a little self-effacing humor there. Uh, and um, this uh, uh, is, um, I have a lot of interesting conversations with my father, who uh, worked as a mortician for a number of years. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, we talk often, and he usually has very strange stories for me. <clears throat> Out in the garage, under a dirty light bulb, I read that the part of the brain that holds the capacity for faith has only the volume of a popcorn kernel. This seed lights up for meditation, for sweaty prayer, or the low, uneven gurgle of a woman who speaks in tongues and retains nothing of her ecstatic prayer. This idea makes sense to me because yesterday, my father, an undertaker, called and told me how he'd guided two little girls to their parents' grave, where they laid out a blanket and four cups of tea, two of which they eventually poured across the dead grass just below the headstone. With my eyes closed, the phone humming against the side of my face, I think I feel that knot of cells flaring to life in the salty nebula of my gray matter, like a searchlight piercing the water to find a destroyed car with two parents 
but no little girls. Maybe this clump of cells is like a signal flare, clawing at the sky in burst of yellow and red before falling back to earth and hissing out. But possibly this knot is nothing more than an exposed light bulb hanging in a garage, collecting dirt and the cooked skeletons of mobs until the wire inside snaps, broken beneath the strain of constant illumination. I have to get used to reading out of a book, I suppose. This is my first book, and uh, so usually I've been a you know paper print flyer where I have just tons of uh, either a notebook or a loose sheets of paper that I'm working off of. Um, it's pretty close to uh, September 11th, and um, I was uh, uh, 18 or 19 when, when it happened. Um, and it has this indelible mark on my uh, memory. And uh, I, I, of course, at the time was worried that I was going to be drafted. I mean, to be honest, uh, I, nobody was sure what was going to happen. And so I was thinking about it uh, almost constantly. And then, of course, uh, we were all exposed to the terrible images that kind of started streaming around that day. And have, it's, I've never really let up since. Um, <clears throat> and I've realized that my students have uh, absolutely no memory of it whatsoever because they're five or six at this point. So it's strange how much uh, that changes from uh, decade to decade. Um, so I have a poem that I wrote about the day after September 11th, um, and it's after X.J. Kennedy, um, who you guys are probably familiar with. <clears throat> the bodies falling from the towers could be coins flipping end over end through black smoke water. Could be hard, blurry rain piercing carbon-saturated clouds to bounce off of the pavement and shatter. Could be anything but people choosing the ground instead of the fire. Later that night, near Cable Airport, I will sit on the hood of my Lincoln and marvel that the sky is empty of airplanes. I will think that the silence is starved for the roar of a rotary engine churning through the thin, frozen air. But that night, out in the black, there are only the dewy afterimages of satellites weaving in and out of the dim ghost story constellations. Although I cannot see it, I know those dim blinking lights are howling back digital echoes of all those people plunging earthward a hard rain of ones and zeros, their descent so absent of the merciful grace of leaves shaken from a tree, of a paper airplane slooping low, of ash and burned scraps of paper drifting to rest on rooftops. So I mentioned my father earlier. He's somebody that's uh, lived a um, very interesting, if hard life. And so I write about him quite a book through this, uh, quite, quite a lot through this collection. Um, and. Uh, uh, and one, at one point, um, I sat down and decided to really just try to um, uh, get every little detail of him, the things that you see when you look at him. And, and um, there's a lot that is apparent about his history just on his face. And so um, this poem is called My Father at the Kitchen Counter. My father is a broken gunslinger, his hands bunched into knots that came from working too hard and fast as a soldier, as a hired gun, half a world away from here. In the white of his left eye, there's a tiny comet of blood, a shattered capillary that hovers forever, just beyond the field of broken blue ice that is his iris. This blood star blazes back in the dishwater light of early morning, while he draws himself up to his full height and grips the edge of the countertop. His face is filled with the passages and furrows that dreams carve on their way out of the body. His crow's feet are the fine webs of glass freshly broken. The spiraling torn edge across his left cheek was left by a stepbrother who would never love him and told him so while wearing his class ring. The permanent darkness in the hollows around his eyes are the tattoos of affairs and addictions, a litany of guilt drawn into the bruised leavings of insomnia. Prop propping himself against that countertop, waiting for the coffee, <clears throat> My father is somewhere else. He's in the place that ruptures blood vessels, that carves lines into wooden faces. He's the last soldier alive on a beach, a reservist in the South Pacific, the sole survivor ankle deep in scarlet water. Each sigh makes his chest visible between the lapels of his cotton bathrobe. It is the Rosetta Stone for the translation of pain, a language made up of the body trying to survive the mind. Each scar, each line of wear, is a sentence in the prophecy of a man who does not yet know that his ear will be amputated in six months, that he will bury his mother in three. They're the story 
of a life that has grown too heavy, of a weight that is still bearing him down. And what the heck, while we're on the subject of my poor dad, here's another one about him. <laughs> it's called Starting Over. And I just like to read this as many places as I can to badmouth the companies contained in the poem. So. My father was fired eight months before his retirement. At 55 years old, after 30 years of working for Verizon, he moved to Florida to sell graves to people before they're dead. He offers headstones, land plots, and funeral arrangements tied together as neatly as the newspaper wrap belongings that he is still not unpacked into the small, empty beach shack. He loses half an ear to skin cancer. On the side of his head, there's just a shiny half moon of scar tissue where there used to be a Roman profile. On the telephone, in the dark, he tells me that graves are hard to sell, but does not say why. But still, he says, still, everyone dies, right? Far away, his voice carried over miles and miles of telephone wire. He says, sometimes you just have to start over. And as he speaks, for some reason, I picture him selling grave plots by thrusting handfuls of dirt into the arms of the bereaved instead of speaking respectfully of the departed from across a mahogany desk. I picture him sitting in the center of a sand-dusted wooden floor of the empty beach house a continent away. The moving boxes are stacked along his living room wall like a row of newspaper clerk mourners huddled around an open grave. Mourners to whom he must soon present a bill. Let's go somewhat more lighthearted. As you guys can tell, I uh, have uh, something of a dark sensibility. Poetry is serious business, right? Uh, so uh, don't have too many jokey poems. Uh, this might be as close as I get. It's called Why I Will Not Donate My Body to Science. Um, I wrote it because my wife is a, a science teacher and now a research scientist. And so uh, I, as a poet, and not to badmouth you other poets, but I have a very little understanding of science. Uh, mostly I think things run on dreams and unicorn stuff and sunsets. Uh, <laughs> And I found an, uh, an interesting fact that the uh, skeletons that you see in classrooms, when they're made out of real bone, they are actually many, many skeletons uh, compiled into one because, uh, because, as you'll see in this poem, it's not possible to use only one skeleton. <clears throat> in her classroom, in the science lab, Carly tells me, not looking up, that the school is raising money for a new skeleton, a human skeleton held together with wires. These cost thousands of dollars maybe more. The chalky weight of them, the craftsmanship of their proteins laid across into one another like heady jewelry, are the salvage of a life. I lift up the arm of the old skeleton, the one that needs replacement. I let it fall. This arm, it could be three people, the thick radius and ulna from a retired cop, the cracked knuckle of a gymnast. We do too much damage to our bodies to use any one skeleton. I myself, have too many calcium stitches across my ribs from kicks and punches I failed to block. I've eroded the joints in my hands, typing late into the night and drawing women. I have jagged edges to my vertebra, the ones that cannot seem to bear the dumb weight of my skull. I could not be in anyone's skeleton. I'm too small. Sometimes my bones, they feel hollow, as if every day they're sublimating. Evapor evaporating in the accumulated glare of my heartbeats, withering from the heat of caging me, the pushing and expanding I feel inside when I read Eliot or hear coyotes howling in the distance. I would not like to be that weak link, the jaw that hangs too loose, the spine that will not stand straight, the hand that cannot hold a fist. There in the classroom, while holding the bones of so many people in that hand, in my hand, I think it would be dishonest to lend them my structure, to fool them with the seeming solidity of me. Because at any moment, I might drift away, might disintegrate and scatter into crenellated pieces. Then the gymnast, the retired cop, they would have nothing left to hold them together, hold them to this earth. And we'd all be forced to stand there, watching some school kid with detention sweep us into the dustbin. And I secretly would not be sorry these chipped teeth, these aching metatarsals, I bought each one, and they hurt, but they were me when I broke against the world, and it was beautiful.
Thank you. I had a, I have a set setup, but then once I get reading, I, I always think like something will link together better than the other ones. Um, so I think that uh, uh, maybe I'll read you guys another optimistic one. <laughs> <laughs> This is very short. This is my attempt at uh, uh, imitating Gary Young. It is not Gary Young, so I apologize in advance. It's called The Sun is Burning Hard, after Gary Young. The sun burns hard off the flat back window of a rust-speckled pickup truck with spots like a robin's egg. The smell of wet pavement is like thunderheads, the potentiality of a secret force waiting to pour down the faces of the blue jean models on a billboard. We, all of us here, Woke up and showered, scrubbed away the night sweats and oils, and are driving east now, out into the endless blue skies and sand plains. I'm in love with this life, with the gravity of it. So uh, I would like to um, finish up with a longer poem. And uh, you say, oh, you're finishing now. It, it's a longer poem. It's, a, it's three parts. Um, so uh, uh, I'll uh, let you guys know uh, uh, as it approaches winding down, although you'll be able to tell. It's my love letter to where I live. Really, this entire book is a, is a love letter to the Inland Empire and the kind of uh, dark, beautiful, creative place it is. It's simultaneously very destructive and creative. It's got all this industry, but it also has these farms tucked away. And kids get out there, and they street race, and they go to punk rock shows. And it's all kind of beautiful, but it's all kind of eroding to the people that live there as well. Um, and so much of this book is, is set there, and this end chapter kind of uh, pulls it all together and, and um, draws together kind of a, a story that I've been telling throughout here. And it features my friend Kaylee that I told you guys about earlier, as do many poems in this book. Uh, I just, uh, uh, you'll see her again here. <clears throat> One, in the dark cab of her fair lane, I said how all summer we broke windows for fun. The pavement still sighing with midnight heat, the witch glow of the dashboard lights in her hair. I whispered how the street races seem to last forever. The screaming tires as mad and lonely as freight trains hissing and roaring through the night between empty lots and shops, shooting toward the grim Los Angeles skyline. The buildings like the slats in some great fence, a barrier we were not fast enough to cross. She was leaning backwards in her seat, head cocked, the firm white line of her neck plunging down her cotton dress, the suggestion of her stomach flat under the material, cotton catching muted moonlight. She dangled one hand outside, the cherry of her cigarette, a spark hovering inches from her thin fingers, a firefly suspended in space, a still pendulum of light and fire that grew bright and dim, bright and dim, spelled out codified certainties, a morse code of a whispered scripture that would never be written down. In the car, I tell her how Joe Aguilera pulled saplings from the ground, his eyes glassy and predatory, his muscles shredding, his palms bleeding, how, on fire with angel dust, he'd walked down the island in the middle of the street and destroyed everything he could touch, howling machine laughter through grinding teeth, how the next morning he woke up screaming, some of his muscles worked off the bone by his own strength. Kaylee just leaned back in her seat, eyes out the window, hands restless at the top of her steering wheel, black nails fluttering toward midnight. I tell her how my mother used to read to me, her thin arms wrapped around me to reach the pages, the slow progression of her fingers tracing the words, me in her lap, the orange arc sodiums tracing the paper between the blinds because the lights were so low in the bedroom, her breath stirring the hair on the back of my neck. Good night, moon. Good night, clock. Good night, owl. I say the words too. I sing them under my breath. I feel her heartbeat fluttering beneath her gardenia-scented skin, a blood-filled metronome ticking against my shoulder. Two. On cloudless nights like these, the lights visible from the foothills, the darkness of the farms breaking on the never-ending warehouses, then against the greater blackness of our home, I can hear Kaylee's bones humming in her grave. One long note twining over and over, sighing between cemetery willows until it spills into my sleep and I step out onto the porch and watch the smoke swirl up into the watery air, evaporating before it has escaped the halo of the street lamps. Here, the stars sometimes form a fractured, half-blind cosmology. 
I do not know their names. I have not tried to learn them. Mostly, if we disappear here, we disappear in cars. Mission Road winds dustily away into the flat amber knife edge of the horizon. The street shines, signs shimmer green lies. Las Vegas, San Diego. The edges here curl inward. The circular logic of time and space. The lessons we learn in the boxy trailer portable classrooms. Now demonstrable in how we never leave, but sometimes vanish completely into folded metal of crashed cars. Two objects wanting to occupy the same space. Their matter intertwined the safety glass and plastic pushed into skin and hair. But not Kaylee. She disappears into the mute hollow of a looped phone cord, her neck occupying the void. Back in school, our teacher showed us a lip stri looped strip of paper, how if we trace it with our fingertips, we could follow it forever without breaking contact. This is the shape of the universe, she says her eyes bright in the slate sky that blazes through the window. In June, the birds sing all night. The street lamps are broken. The house settles and moans. There's honeysuckle outside, and it froths indoors through the windows. I run my palm flat across the stomach of a girl who never knew these people. Outside, a train is cutting through the night, a finger tracing in the darkness, but never lifting moving through the silent hulks of buildings in the distance, of empty lots filled with orchard ghosts. It is a song from your car radio tuned between stations, the snap and hiss shaping into your elegy. Good night, Kaylee. Good night, factories. Good night, Los Angeles skyline. Good night, rabbits rustling back and forth in the hutch. Good night, ghost lights in your hair. Good night, Joe. Your shoulders too big for my arms to fit around. Good night, train. Good night, stars, pregnant with darkness and nonsense omens. Good night, clock, winding down, the seconds always growing longer. Good night, mom, shadow traveling up the wall, growing thin. Good night, moon. Good night, owl. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank you, Scott, wherever you are. That was a lovely reading. And I'm so glad to be here. I don't, I don't expect this to be topping this feeling. That's a little joke. One thing is very clear. The golden years are overrated. I learned this in the year I became superannuated. <laughs> what I've got is a haiku. Sun is glaring white. World is withering beneath. Where is September? <laughs>